what do we know there? And I think there's a few tiers for this for me personally. Um, first of all, quantitatively in terms of research, we have um, decades of research that highlight that African Americans are more likely uh, to be um, pulled over, disproportionately um, arrested, um, et cetera. Um, and like I said, I think the, the data on that is, 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 is clear. Um, you, know, I, you know, I've lived in a number of, of cities, Philadelphia, uh, Baltimore City, and Orlando, and when, whether, you know, you talk local law enforcement or activists or when the federal government com, um, comes in and, do, and looks at patterns, you see uh, disproportionately the African-Americans are stopped. Um, so that's what we know quantitatively. Um, we also know, obviously, African-Americans are more likely to be incarcerated, et cetera, which relate to, you know, a number of education, um, health care, and economic issues. Um, but we also, what I also know is... Um, based on personal experience, because as an African-American male living in America, um, I've had a number of friends, family members, who've been disproportionately stopped, either in the driving their cars, um, and, they're, and they're driving in their neighborhoods, jogging, et cetera. Um, so, and I've had, those also have had those same experiences. Um, so, you know, we have decades of quantitative research to back up, and you hear a lot of that with the George Floyd conversation, particularly in Minnesota, uh, and the challenges they've encountered in terms of their uh, disproportionate rate which African Americans are, are arrested and killed. Um, so we have a, not a, just a, a state problem, a problem in Minnesota, or very, we have a national problem. And that, that issue has been talked about for decades. But I think what's happened with the George Floyd um, case is murder. And, and when you intersect that with COVID-19 and all the other challenges the country is dealing with, it's, it's just all come to a head, essentially. We have a systematic problem um, that you know, for African Americans, um, this has been a challenge relating to all the issues we, we, we you know, we're talking about and, and various other ones, um, bef you know, since this country was a colony, <laughs> you know, before it was even a nation. Um, so these issues, these, um, you know, you know, what you're seeing across the country, and like I said, Philadelphia, Minnesota, Washington, D.C., et cetera, uh, keep occurring, and I lived, I was in Baltimore during Freddie Gray, um, and even if you go back to the 80s when the move incident in Philadelphia, I was, I was, I was in, in Philadelphia at that time um, as, a, as a young teenager. So these incidents keep happening because we refuse to, as a nation to address those issues. Um, and, and in these times like this are tough for people of African descent, um, because, you know, these are this, I have a 17-year-old son, and we're having this conversation, I had the conversation with my dad, and, and going back generations. Uh, this keeps happening because we refuse to address this issue. First of all, we have to acknowledge as a country that systemic racism or is the cause of all the economic, health, education, uh, policy disparities we see. Um, and secondly, we have to do something about it. We can't, you know, the country, in my opinion, the country, we've run out of time in terms of trying to ignore this issue. There, there's no more, we're out of time. And I think this country has to make a decision now because we're, we're on the precipice. Um, we have a number of challenges deal with COVID-19 over a number of years, and you can't continue to ignore um, African-American community, the Native American community, and other marginalized populations um, who are play a vital role in this country moving forward because we know the demographics are shifting. So and by 2042, the populations that are suffering are gonna be, are gonna be the, represent the majority of this country. This has not changed, this is not new. You won't find anyone interviewing me or any, you know, if you stop someone in the streets of Orlando, et cetera, or, or Oakland or St. Louis or Miami, um, who's black, who will tell you that they're surprised. Because they're not, because this has been happening uh, for a number of years. Um, I think that the advent of uh, cell phones and the technology has um, made some of the other country, I wouldn't say aware, uncomfortable. Because these are, these are hidden truths that people understand happen. Um, but you have to do something about it. Um, so I don't think the relationships between uh, law enforcement and African American community have really um, have, have evolved. Um, these are these are um, stories that you hear about, whispered about um, when you're a small child and, and you're and you're, in, you're near the dining table and you hear members of your, of your family talk about it. Um, and this is a personal issue for me. You know, I've had family members who are law enforcement. I have two fraternity brothers who I'm very close with, who I text on a group text yesterday, um, and we, you know, not only and trying to find out how all the other black men in that group text were. But also, I've known them for more than 20 years. And also, you know, I'm concerned about their safety because they're like brothers to me. But they also understand that this is a systemic issue that we have to address. 
And uh, I think it's important to note also that members, you know, in African American community, you see the frustration nationally, but they're just physically and emotionally tired. Um, I can't tell you how many friends I've been in contact with the last few weeks. Um, you know, obviously, this is not the only case involving uh, you seeing a black man being killed on, on video. Um, and regardless of their social economic status, they're just they're just tired. And I think that being you know on my, on my years and, and being on this planet, I've 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 never seen this level of frustration. I think that it's it's a cumulative effect of everything that's occurred, and that we have to take immediate action as a country. And I'm talking about someone with a form of with a policy background that the federal and state level we have to be uh, we have to be prepared to address these issues. We you know disproportionately in terms of COVID-19 has been impacting Black and, La and Latino um, and Latino communities, um, Native American communities. Uh, we know the unemployment rate is disproportionately impacting our communities. Um, and then you know the concern of a lot of, the lot of rhetoric um, we're seeing it arise in um, militias, um, et cetera, throughout the United States. And you 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 combine that with the continued video of 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 black people being killed. And, you know, it, it's, it's, it's an imperfect storm. And as, a, you know, as an American, as someone who believes in democracy, as I said previously, we have to do something about it. But yeah, those are all, you know, those are all factors. But the bottom line is that this is, this is reality. And then, like I said, like I said, I, used to, I worked on Capitol Hill for five years. Um, and I can tell you that this is not new. Policymakers understand this from both, both sides of the aisle. That people, Americans, are aware of this. Many of them, some of them, may not, it's not, if it doesn't impact you from day to day, like it impacts me, then it may, you know, why should you, you know, why should you worry about it? But now that we see when these things come to a head, now we see all Americans trying to figure out what's going on, but members of the black community are about clear about what's been going on for centuries now. African Americans been, cannot be responsible for undoing years of systemic racism that occurred years before they were even born. Uh, Congresswoman Demings can undo something in her few years as chief or member of Congress in terms of how many years she serves, to undoing every, uh, a root that has grown throughout every aspect, every institution in this country. She can't possibly do that. It's not incumbent on her and it's not the responsibility of, of Congresswoman and then, and then Chief Demings to, Demings, uh, Demings to do that. I am also also add that if you look at President Obama, being President of the United States is the most powerful position in the United States. However, he was powerless to, to stop people from uh, birtherism and saying that he's not from the United States. So I, I, I highlight that story because that shows you the power of systemic racism, is that an African-American to ascend the highest, most, in highest position in the United States and more powerful position in the world and still be, uh, as, as, a, as a black man, be, um, is incapable of stopping uh, into one of those rumors that suggest that he's, um, he's different. And as researchers, we refer to this, uh, this term as being othered. I'm not researching issues relating to race from afar. This is an issue that impacts my every single day of my life. Before I was born, my entire life, um, and will impact the life of my, my son. So this is an issue I care very passionately about because I know that after this broadcast, if I walk outside, go for a run, get in my car, no one sees it, the, the title, I'm an African-American male. And I'm always, and I'm completely aware of that. And I've been aware of that since, since the first day I was born. How do you talk to your to your son about it? Um, do you do you talk with him about your own experiences? What kind of conversations do you have, and uh, what do you tell him to expect? Yeah, thank you for this question because I think that's really important. I think especially people are watching this to understand. So, you know, my wife and I, you know, after we get married, we had our son, and we spent all, you know his entire the majority of his you know young years and childhood adolescence telling him how wonderful he is, telling him he was splendid, he was gifted, he was talented, he's going to be successful. But that at one point when I was sitting on the couch, I looked at my son and I realized that he had reached the age that he was no, that our people outside won't see him as cute anymore. As a little guy, they'll see him as a black male. And I had to have what we call in the black community to talk. I had to sit and have a conversation with him about the challenges he can encounter when he, when he um, you know, he may be perhaps confronted with law enforcement or, or in school um, and have that conversation, which is one of the most difficult things a black parent has to do with their children and tell them after they've told them the majority of their life that they're, they're wonderful, but you had to have a disclaimer, an asterisk. And it is a painful conversation that I had and continue to have with him um, that he's 17 and a half. Um, we're still having conversations about what's going on now, but 
he's not surprised. I've talked to him about things, in, you know, throughout history. Um, and my wife and I take a lot of pride in, 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 in preparing him uh, for our society, not just being, you know, going off to college next year, um, but also the fact that he's a black male and that there are challenges in the society are real and you have to be prepared.